the version of the of the Old Testament that we have that your English Bible is translated from is an 11th century document called the Masoretic Recension. Um, and that's it's from the Middle Ages. So we obviously know that it wasn't written then. Uh, nobody thinks it was written then. Um, what the people who wrote that manuscript did is they copied older manuscripts very, very carefully, letter by letter, basically like a human photocopier. So it's kind of like if you have, let's say you had a, um, a modern printing of a play by Shakespeare, of Romeo and Juliet, and you want to know when this was written. Uh, so you can look at the front of the book and it's going to say this was written in 2017. But you've got a pretty good idea that Romeo and Juliet's not actually written in 2017. You can, you know that there have been there have been plays performed of it earlier. There's earlier copies of it. You can find yeah. go to your library and find a book that's that's published in like 1890 that's still got it written in there and it's still the same. So that tells you that whoever wrote this, whenever Shakespeare lived, was older than this. You know that you can't just look at the document you have. You have to try to trace the record back. Mm -hmm. through its history and so you can look for you can look for other references in other pieces of literature to see if anybody mentions Romeo and Juliet see if any any other literature quotes from it and this is this is what we do with the bible as well we can see that people are quoting from the old testament much earlier than the documents that we have written and when we dug up the dead sea scrolls in in Qumran, which is the oldest manuscripts that we have, they match very, very closely to that 11th century document. You know, just like if you found, if you went to a, found a 16th century book of Shakespeare, it would match very closely. So that tells us that these texts are actually very, very old, much older than we actually have something, some, any, any physical record of. Mm. So what we then do is the same thing you would do with your Shakespeare. You would look at the way that it's written, at the way it uses the English language, and you would wonder, well, when in the history of English language did people talk like this? And you would figure that it was roughly about 1500s. And so that's a very good clue that that is when your printing of Shakespeare was actually produced. And we can do this with the Bible as well. We look at the Hebrew that it's written in, and we try to figure out the when in history, as best we can tell, did the people using Hebrew talk like this? And the majority consensus of this is that the people who wrote in Hebrew and talked like this were writing in roughly the early, early Persian period, right after the Babylonian exile. So about the same time as the narrative settings of books like uh like um ezra or esther or daniel mm -hmm. and so when we talk about people who wrote the bible that's usually the area that people look in now some people like to think that its content is even older than that um and the problem that we start to get to in this is that once you start getting older than that, like um, traditionally Genesis, for example, um, for a long time was thought to be written by Moses. Moses lives in roughly uh, 13, 1500 BC. Hebrew as a language doesn't exist back then. Mm. So if Moses wrote anything down and the book of Exodus says he did, um, the words that he wrote aren't the words that hmm. are written in your version of the book of Exodus. Hmm. That would have, they would have been written in some kind of proto Hebrew language hmm. that eventually someone translated some, and this is, this is how people in the ancient world handle um, documents. We know that they didn't do this human photocopier thing, the way that the, that the Masoretes did and the way that we do now. Huh they took them and they updated them and we know from we can see a record of this 
process in in non-biblical documents. This is another way, reason why these comparisons are useful. We can see how people handled texts. Um, because in, in the ancient world prior to roughly the Greek era, writing was not an important way to preserve information. Uh, information was preserved orally through the repetition of telling stories, um, kind of the same way the liturgy works if, you, if you're in a tradition that uses a liturgy. So they, they tied the authority of their, of their records and their stories and their traditions and their beliefs about their gods and their history and their identity as a people through the stories they told about themselves which could presumably be changed and edited over time, but not wouldn't normally be. Um, we think that they were probably preserved reasonably well. And at some point they were written down when writing started to become an important means of preserving information. And that's the version that we have now. But the version that we have now is the version of their tradition that would have been most meaningful to them. Um, and that's still important to know to know who they are and when they wrote. So that, that makes a lot of sense, you know, with with the, the Hebrew part where we we have to be willing to deal with what, what we have and and the, you know the, the big thing there is it seems to me like the the words that they chose and the Hebrew that we have today had to be something that they understood at that particular time. Otherwise, they wouldn't have chose those words. You know, it wasn't just straight copying as you talked about. Um, maybe can you talk just a little bit more about what kind of flexibility is there? And like, I mean, are we talking about just completely different stories for when when? Um, so are you, do you mean do you mean like the fr from the any kind of oral or written sources to the Bible we have or from the Bible we have to the translations we have now? Uh, specifically, you know, you said right after the exile in the Persian period, because that's where the Hebrew we have there. Uh, yeah. and, and maybe, you know, there's other sources that they're bringing onto the text or compiling together and all that. But at the end of the day, the Hebrew that they have then, th that right there, um, how much flexibility do they have with that? Um, well, to to produce the version that we had out of whatever whatever source material they had in their culture, they had a lot of flexibility. Um, it's we it's for from a theological perspective, we say it's the text that's inspired, which means what they made was inspired. They're the people that God worked through to put the words that we have down so they had they would have had as much flexibility as god has which is quite a bit um from their own perspective though they're writing for an audience they're they're not this isn't like their diary um creating like musings for themselves these are written for people and so what they wrote was limited in that it still had to be meaningful for the people that they wrote to. And again, you had, the only way we can figure out who these people are is try to guess, but we think that the people that they were writing to was the Jewish community who was either returning from exile into into uh, Judea or scattered throughout the Mediterranean world and the diaspora. And these were the people who ultimately preserved these writings and made them into their scriptures. And that's how we know that they were meaningful to them because they did that. Um, we, do have, we do have evidence that some other people were engaging in a parallel process. Um, if you've read the New Testament, you know about the Samaritans. The Samaritans are an alternative um, early Jewish remnant who had their own version of the Pentateuch and made their own version of the Book of Chronicles. And 
we have these and they're different. So we can tell that they were taking the same source material and they were spinning it or embellishing it or telling these stories in their own way that came up with something different. And other people may have been doing that as well. We just don't have them. So when we say that this particular text is inspired, we're saying that whoever was compiling this material for whatever reason, um, the, the meaning they tried to draw from their own history, the um, implications of that history that they had kind of established for themselves and were trying to transmit to people as something meaningful and edifying for them to know and to have and preserve, that this kind of inspiration is God's endorsement of that, to say that, yeah, they're, what they were trying to say is right. And that's why that's the version that's preserved. That's why that's the version that we used. It doesn't really matter where they got these ideas because inspiration doesn't work like dictation. God doesn't like put them in a trance and move their hands to write things. Um, it's, it's a subliminal thing that we think that God works through their mental processes, but doesn't, he doesn't hijack it. It's works through the ideas that they're having to say something that God wanted to say. And that's ultimately more important than than how much flexibility they had to create that product um mm. it's imp more important to understand what they were trying to say than where they got the idea from i guess mm. okay so it sounds like you're saying that I mean, even if there were just original tablets, as some Christians say, that contain all of the the book of Genesis from when it was originally written by God, like Genesis 1, that was written by Adam or God, and we have the original tablets, even if that were the case, we still have some flexibility, some translation when it originally came to Hebrew. So those ideas for when it was written down in Hebrew or was was probably going to be different than I mean, this, the original. This would actually be really interesting. So um, what Bible scholars like to do, I, I started talking about this earlier and didn't want to, but what, the, what Bible scholars like to do is they want to find those original tablets. Um, they very, very want, much want them. They're, um, they call them sources. And they, they say, Bible scholars say that, you know, the version that the version of the Hebrew text that we have was put together by people in the in the Persian period, um, but that's not where God's authority is. That text was not inspired. That text was just a bunch of political people making up crap for their own for their own benefit and their own exploitation. The real the real inspired stuff is the stuff that was written before that. The stuff that they took and corrupted. And so what Bible scholars want to do is they want to kind of deconstruct that text to see if they can find these kind of unaltered remnants earlier. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of convoluted theories about how to do that. But really, the whole idea comes down to where we think inspiration lies. What if we did find a tablet that was not written in Hebrew? but that was like a foundation document, like what Josiah says he found, what Josiah finds in, in second Kings, or if we find some tablets that may have been in the Ark of the Covenant that are written in some, some kind of um, proto Hebrew thing, would that replace the Bible as God's inspired word? And I'm not sure that it would. It's kind of like, since it's not it's not put together by by rote, it's not just blind copying and blind inaccurate copying at that. It's composed. There's there's an intent behind the form of the message in the book that we have. Mm -hmm. And if we did find some of the earlier stuff, like um, 
the Bible actually cites some of its sources. Uh, if you read through the books of Kings, it's like this, this, this stuff is recorded in the annals of the Kings of, of Israel and Judah. We could, we could potentially find that. And it might not say the same thing that the book of Kings does. It would definitely say a lot more because it would be a more complete record, but would we, would we replace it? Or would we, <laughs> would we think like, okay, this was a, this was a draft maybe like this was a source is what they call it a source, but it's not inspired because it's not the version that was preserved. It's not mm. the version that the community took and venerated and said, these are our scriptures. This is the story that, and the, the message and the history and everything that tells us about who we are and how we are related to our God. And I think that that's ultimately more important that what we have inspired is a text, but it's not a, it's not a, the te it's not a text as a corrupted artifact. It's a text as a medium for a for a message and a story and a collection of ideas. And it's those ideas that are ultimately what is important to us as Christian the Christian theologians. So, if we find something that isn't isn't one of those, we that, that it's it's not those ideas, it's not this collection, then it probably wouldn't actually be that important, um, except from a purely historical perspective, just like any of the information we find about um, about Israel or about anything else from that world from from other other sources ultimately isn't that relevant.